Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus again today. I am Trace, and this is episode three of three in our series about the sun with Dr. Ian O'Neill, who studied it, right? That's my favorite topic. That's pretty cool. So if you haven't subscribed, make sure you subscribe. If you haven't seen the other two episodes in this series, go back so you know what plasmas and coronas and, you know, all this other awesome stuff are. Uh, so you get all that stuff. And then come back and watch this episode number three. So, Ian, so far we've talked about what you studied, little teeny coronal loops, and we talked about Svalbard, which is cool, and, you know, where you were studying things. We also uh, talked a bit about kind of how the sun is put together and how we look at it. But why do we care about all this stuff? I mean, the sun is just going to hang out there. It's going to be there for as long as we are alive and our kids and our kids' kids and our kids' kids' kids and our kids' 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 kids for like a long time. Yeah, for a couple more billion years. So right. really, who cares? I yeah. mean, that's really the question. It's like scientists have always got to justify their existence, not only to people like us saying why, yeah. but also uh, funding bodies You know, where they get their money. So they have to justify their science. And for solar physics... I think it's pretty clear, and the sun can affect our everyday lives. Not to give you a sunburn, obviously that's a concern, but it that's is. really you know a health issue. Yeah. Um, whereas space weather is kind of important. Now, people, when you think of weather, you think you know it's raining outside, right? And you don't really think how the sun affects space weather. But space weather is basically any impact that the sun has on the Earth's environment. So basically, a huge coronal mass ejection could hit Earth to create this uh, geomagnetic storm, which could in turn create all these amazing aurora in in, in Svalbard. Yay! I got to that see. That sounds great. You didn't get to see because it's 24-hour it light. Hour daytime. So then once the auroras happen, though, is that all that's really... I mean, it sounds cool. It's like, oh, yeah, CME, the coronal mass ejection or CME hits the atmosphere and makes uh, all this pretty colors. But is not is that it? Like, we care because we want to know more about these pretty colors? or Well... Yeah, because they are pretty. Come on, yeah. they are pretty colors. But when these particles actually hit Earth, they generate like a current that flows around the atmosphere. So during times of like solar maximum, which is when these flares and the solar wind is more intense and when coronal mass ejections happen. Which we're in now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we're, we're at no, the we're end of we're, Yeah, we're actually approaching solar minimum right now. So oh. the sun is very quiet. Um, there's some weird stuff going on with the sun. So we still get aurora. We still get the occasional geomagnetic storm, which is basically the sun's um, magnetic field interacting with Earth's magnetic field, injecting all this plasma, basically these charged particles, into our atmosphere. And what happens when they actually get into our atmosphere and they rain through the upper atmosphere, they can create these currents. And in extreme cases, they can actually generate ground-based currents that can knock out entire power grids. What? So that that affects you, you know? Yeah. And, and actually, it's happened in the past, and it's probably going to happen again during intense, uh, intense solar activity. And actually, power grid companies have mechanisms in place where they will actually lower the power of their power output just to avoid these spikes so they don't blow out any pa any substations. And so there's like a few doomsday theories around this idea that perhaps a solar flare could knock out international power grids and if that happens you don't have any power and that's a problem it takes a long time to put all that stuff back together exactly again. and it's expensive got it so by watching the sun and by looking at this space weather yep. then we can understand more about how that space weather is going to affect us here on the ground uh, because of the effects in the atmosphere and creating currents and all of that stuff so exactly. it can affect uh we were talking a little bit about that uh, the other day so it can affect radio transmissions how does it do that yeah so i mean like um when um on the surf in the area that i was actually really interested in the lower corona you get these um these magnetic field lines that cross and if they cross they can reconnect and so, so it's cross the streams yeah, don't cross these streams, no, because they produce a big flare. And these can be X-ray flares. So they'll produce X-ray radiation. X-ray radiation can then, and they happen like immediately. So as soon as you just see the light coming from the sun from these flares, you're already hit by the X-rays. Oh, so you can't really predict that. So if we can see these active regions kind of rotating into view and there's a high chance, like a high probability of perhaps an X-ray flare happening, you can get the astronauts indoors and oh, they can so stay not protected. So outside when an X-ray flare exactly. would cause what would be a large amount of radiation to pass by the yeah. International Space Station, which is outside of Earth's protection. Because my yeah. assumption is if you're on the surface, 
the Earth protects us. The atmosphere and the magnetosphere protects us from yeah, that. Yeah, so, so the atmosphere is th thick enough to so actually um, absorb most of the energy from X-ray flares. So down here on Earth, we're not affected. We don't mm -hmm. get an increased dose because the atmosphere has done its job. It's taken one for the team, and it's absorbed all of this energy. I'm padding it. I'm padding it Yeah, right now absolutely. Well, and, and, and funny enough, so when it does take one for the team, the ionosphere, which is the upper atmosphere where the auroras happen, it actually expands, it heats up. And that can be a, ha a secondary hazard in that the atmosphere gets bigger. And what happens when the atmosphere gets bigger? Well, satellites that are orbiting in the upper atmosphere can exp experience some drag. So when they experience drag, they slow down and they can actually have their orbits modified. So basically Whoa. satellite... Uh, satellite um, um, companies, they have to make sure that they can correct their orbits or at least know that when the atmosphere is going to grow. And also, I mean, just, just the fact that we're going to get hit by x-rays is not a good thing. Yeah. And it can actually ionize the upper atmosphere and create radio blackouts affecting like air traffic control and radio transmissions around the globe. Wow. So there's a lot of impacts that can happen. That's so this crazy. Is, this is how you get your funding. Because I was interested in the stuff the, the the origin of the solar uh, of the solar wind at the origin of these flares and coronal mass ejections and it may have seemed like a very small area that I was studying but it had a greater impact on the larger community of solar physics because we want to know what triggers these events and coronal loops are one of those triggers wow that's crazy it's cool so when it comes back to coronal loops, though, it's about those magnetic field lines. And when those magnetic field lines get really, really big, we end up getting things like sunspots. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, these um, these coronal loops are created from the, um, from the sun's interior um, magnetic field. So these are coming from deep within the core of the sun. Basically, it's called the solar dynamo, where, the, where these magnetic fields are generated. And these magnetic fields have to go somewhere, so they end up poking out through the, the sun's photosphere. As they do this, they kind of push aside the upper layers of, of the sun. Yeah. So what you see is kind of counterintuitive. You look into the sun, you're actually seeing a cooler sun. So the in interior of the sun is actually cooler than its surface, if you can imagine. It's hmm. kind of weird. That is weird. So this is what I was trying to work out. Why is, why is the, the atmosphere of the sun hotter than the interior? But a very obvious um, thing to see is, is uh, these, these sunspots that basically are these upper layers being pushed aside by the, uh, by the magnetic fields from inside. So you're actually seeing into the sun. And where you find these regions of a lot of sunspots, when you have like this massive outbreak of sunspots on the sun, it means it could be in very, it's very magnetically active. And there's a high chance that these magnetic fields that are poking out through, uh, through the, the sun's surface will reconnect, possibly cause flares, possibly create coronal Don't mass cross ejections. The crossing the streams like Don't crazy. Do it. And it's just insane. I mean, the, and the solar wind's going much faster. And it's just, you know, during solar maximum, it can be an exciting time. I mean, some people get really upset about it and, it, and you know, kind of excited. And they think there's all these doomsday theories, which, quite frankly, There was a big eye crazy. roll for those listening on iTunes. That was a big eye roll. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm hiding <laughs> the truth as well. <laughs> Who's paying you? Who's paying you to say these things? So you get all these amazing, intricate things happening on the surface of the sun. And they can have very meaningful impacts on Earth. And you've got to remember, the sun has no regard for life on Earth. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care that we're here. It doesn't care that we've got satellites out there. It doesn't care that we're playing Pokemon and catching monsters on our phone. It can just throw a flare at us and knock out a power grid, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. It could happen, but that is why we need good uh, space weather forecasting. This is why we want to know in advance when these things are going to come and hit us. And this is why we got a lot of observatories looking at the sun in the highest definition possible, just so we can see these things going on. That's so cool. Yep. So it sounds like your PhD was awesome. It was fun. It was a lot of programming. Yeah, I, I wasn't. Oh, really? I was a theorist, but I, mm. I, was, I, was, I looked at lots of nice theorist. pictures of the sun. But I, it was mainly computer code. Yeah, but that's still cool. Yeah, it is now. It is cool <laughs> now because you know, I get invited on radio shows. Yeah. But um, at the time, yeah, it was it was, it, was, it was pretty hard, but it was uh, it was good. It was nice to contribute to a, a, big, a larger body of physics. Yeah. So for sure, and uh, I think just to kind of wrap this up. Your studying of the 
basis of solar weather, which can affect so much of life on Earth, especially now that we are an electrified society, mm -hmm. um, uh, which I guess sidebar really quick, I think you mentioned that this has happened before. Yeah. And I remember reading about it because it happened in like a, a yes. time before we had been fully electrified. So it knocked out a bunch of power grids and yeah. people weren't really sure what would happen. Yeah, I think it was in, um, in Canada back in uh, yeah. 89, I think. Yeah, something like that. And so it just wasn't the same as it is now. You know, yeah, now so we are even we're exponentially more electrified than we were even 30 years ago. But also so. we're much better at predicting space weather now. So and there's um, serious efforts underway to predict these problems because real world events could happen in the wake of these solar storms. The governments are like, well, you know, this could cause big problems for our nation if uh, if our power grid gets knocked out or we lose GPS. GPS satellites, you know, they are vulnerable up there. Mm -hmm. So it's and good it's not these like you can place. just turn off the power grid and that works. I mean, yeah. if you run a current through a wire, you create a magnetic field. Or if you run magnets around a wire, you create electricity. Yeah. And loops and loops of wire, you know, millions upon millions of feet of wire are spread all over our planet. And if a magnetic event happened large enough, it would just spontaneously generate electricity in all these wires. Yeah, it's basic physics. And an amazing thing is in the mid 1800s, there was a big solar flare event and um, tele telegraph operators were actually electrocuted by the uh, by the electricity generated in their lines across the country. That's crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. And so it did really happen. There were small there were small fires. So just imagine what happens over the millions of miles of cable that runs in, throughout our planet. Just imagine one data center that yeah. keeps the internet running. And one. And, and also, I mean, that's so much cable. And also, the concern is that a lot of um, power systems are kind of outdated now. Mm -hmm. So a lot of substations are kind of old technology. And if they blow, there's no real replacement for them. So imagine 100 substations going out at once. There's no replacement. You have to build them from scratch. So what happens Could in the meantime? a decade yeah. to rebuild all that infrastructure. Exactly. I mean, it's crazy. It can take a long time. So, and the estimate is it could cost trillions of dollars to repair in a big solar storm event. That's crazy. So I guess to kind of wrap it up, which I started to do and then stopped doing, um, we can't get a prediction on space weather without understanding how to look at the sun. We can't understand how to look at the sun with things like the SDO and SOHO and you know ground-based telescopes without understanding more about what the sun does and how it works. So to kind of tie it all back, the more we study the sun, the more we learn about it, and the more we can understand how it's going to affect us and what's going to happen. Because 100 years ago, we probably didn't know a lot of this stuff about no, we had, how the sun worked. We had very little idea. And, it, and of course, in the last 50 years, we've been trying to work out why the sun's atmosphere is so hot. And to be honest, we don't have an exact answer yet, although we are closing in. That's so crazy. I mean, you would think that the one answer that science would have is why is the sun so hot? Well, and we don't really have 100% of that figured out. We don't. And that's the exciting thing about science. I love science so much. Guys, why don't you let us know down in the comments if you were going to get a PhD, what you'd want to get it in. Make so, sure you, Solar physics. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Make sure you come find us on Twitter. You can find Ian at Astro Engine. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. You can find the show at DNews. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you use the hashtag DNewsPlus if you want to tweet at us. Thanks for tuning in, like I just said, twice. Bye.